you are here to hear about raising great kids while dealing with the challenges of marriage, separation, or divorce, I will just say a couple quick things. For those of you who are brand new to the community, welcome to The Great Parenting Show. We're in the process of rebranding, and we'll you'll hear more about that as time goes on. But in the meantime, we're certainly still presenting and doing a lot of parent coaching and teaching as well. So I'm Jacqueline Green, and I'm the founder of The Great Parenting Show. I have been a parenting educator and coach and speaker since my daughter was a year old and she is turning 18 this summer um, and I founded the Great Parenting Show in 2010. Um, we've had over 30,000 listeners on the show since and my work's been featured in magazines, newspapers and TV um, including one of the, the real fun ones for sure is being on the Huffington Post Live a few times. I think that before though I go any further, I want to talk a little bit about why me in terms of co-parenting and, and why am I presenting to you on that. We've had over 135 experts, top experts in all sorts of parenting related fields have been on the show. And co-parenting specifically became like so many of you, you know, very quickly upon having kids, I started studying the subject and my eldest is just turned 20. And so for the last 20 years, I've been reading books, taking courses, and then also coaching a lot of clients, passing on what I learned from my experience in the trenches. And one of the honors that I've had in terms of people seeking me out for co-parenting advice is to be featured on Susan Stiffelman's fabulous co-parenting without power struggle series last fall. And I was blessed because the man on the left, Harville Hendricks, was one of the first parenting educators, or sorry, relationship ex educators whose work I um, started to learn. And, and one of the first people to give me the wonderful concept of whoever we're with and whatever challenges we're having are actually there to serve our highest purpose and to grow and mature us. And, and really delighted to have some of the, these other people have been on The Great Parenting Show as well as being other people I've learned from, including people like Dr. John Gray and Glennon Doyle Melton. So the best reason, though, I think I have for speaking on the subject and certainly something that people seek me out to talk about is how to go from having a very challenging marriage and at the height of our challenges we've had I guess you know a couple heights and the second one being separating for good three plus years ago but the first time within a year of my daughter's birth I took both children and went to a woman's shelter and stayed apart for four months to stop the escalating physical violence and really I was thinking today of how this picture is more apt than I was consciously thinking about it at the time because while there was escalating physical violence to things around me um, you know, I, I was in the threatening type of picture that this woman was not directly hit. And it was wonderful to have been on a growth path that, that year before that meant that I was able to be clear when it was time to go and, and able to leave and not come back until the, the physical was really resolved. And yeah, but that challenging marriage, despite the fact that the last three years have been very intense and I will be sharing a little bit more in an email in the next little bit to you, those of you who are, are in the Great Parenting Show community, just so you understand how, what's up a little bit and, and how things are going to unfold for the next six months of 2017. But despite that really challenging marriage, this beautiful picture is of my thriving kids. My daughter actually is about to graduate in two weeks and two days. She will have her ceremony and my son, this was his grad two years ago, which was a year after his dad and I separated for good. So despite the fact that my marriage has been and, and remains very challenging in terms of the separation being on the high end of, of challenging um my kids are thriving and thriving you know academically in terms of relationships they both have jobs my daughter's a lifeguard my son works um at doing programming with children at the library this summer and it's just really fun watching how they really have taken their place as at least as well adjusted as my peers who have and my friends who have more, you know, in most cases intact families. So really I see I see in parenting period 
there are two paths nowadays. And one path is the way it's so well traveled. And that path is, you know, parents who are staying together, having children who are really challenged and, and the marriage is really strained and really challenged. The other path being finding that way to have fabulous kids, no matter what your situation is. And it's my passion to help you to both get on the less conflictual path if you're married still or either way how to make sure that your children are in a better place oh and wonderful I, I see we have someone from calgary in the audience too which is fabulous i just i gave this presentation for the first time live i in person a couple weeks ago and this is i should have said this at the beginning this is the first time i'm presenting this work formally in in the world with the exception of the one time in the school in calgary and i'm so passionate about it, it i had been teaching different parts of this in courses and directly with coaching clients and it's really fun to put this together for you and so give me lots of feedback love to hear what resonates most with you what you'd like to hear more about and I will say this absolutely could be a course right I did quite a few years ago do a strong enough to stay and that's my upcoming book strong enough to stay subtitle change to smart enough to go after the second time I left but that um, I did do a course on it will definitely do it again so what I'm hoping today is to give you the sense that you that there's help that no matter how you know I, I give the example of this buoy the life buoy being thrown out to you because when we feel like we're drowning it's all it's just amazing to know that someone else has been there and that you can figure out no matter what situation you're in, you can get to a better place. So who is this talk for? Well, it's mainly aimed for heterosexual moms. And I want to be you know, clear that that is the majority of my audience for sure. Most of you are in marriages that are going well, marriages, first off. Many of you are marriages that are going well, but you see the, the seeds, the cracks in the foundation. Some of you are in rocky marriages. Some of you definitely who are single parents. Now, dads, moms, um, the, you know, people who are in gay marriages or seeking specific tips for blending, blended families, you will find some applicable information here. Lots of it, very applicable. But I also really encourage you to ask questions so that I can tailor the information for you as well. So this, I really want to stress, none of this is an invitation to feel guilty because you may hear some things that make you realize, wow, have I ever contributed to the very problems that are driving me nuts, right? I hope you get that vision because when you see that, then you see your power to make change and it's crazy powerful. So many speakers talk about you know, us being the change and people like Stephen Covey talk about starting with our ourselves and, and, you know, it's powerful. But I don't want you to use this as an invitation to feel guilty because we are parenting in crazy times in so many ways. And one of them, I'm going to talk about some myths today that feed into parenting um, challenges. And one of them is that, that you cannot help but pick up the attitudes and beliefs that are around you. But many of them are not helpful for co-parenting challenges. So my goal is to inspire you to see things differently and help you see how things can be so much easier. I am pretty sure that you all will understand and, and know that I cannot in an hour plus, and this will go a little bit over an hour, um, I cannot in that time you know, tell you everything there is to, to know about co-parenting and change your trajectory for good, although I can change your trajectory as long as you get the ahas that inspire you to take this further. And I'm going to talk more about this throughout, but I really want you, it was co-parenting and the way parenting and specifically co-parenting in a situation that was going sideways fast taught me the meaning of this saying, wherever you go, there you are, because it, without a doubt, if you take the challenge, co-parenting challenges can get you to the happiest place that you could get to in, on so many levels and, and really transform you. So with the four main topics we're going to talk about is a little bit about why co-parenting is such a hot topic nowadays. Definitely going to dive into keeping the co-parenting bond strong. Co-parenting conflicts, we'll talk about dealing with those. And then some additional notes about separation and divorce, which obviously includes 
taught um, the section before the co-parenting conflicts. So why is co-parenting such a top hot topic? And I'd love, as I said, you know, share your thoughts as, as you are listening. Um, there's a few interesting facts. Many people get married thinking that having kids, getting married and having kids will make them a lot happier. And having children, the interesting things is that the studies have been quite conclusive recently saying that marital satisfaction and new parents actually declined. So that, you know, is kind of sobering. Now, interesting because the fact of the matter is many of us immediately recognize that the joy of, of having a child, you know, we're often okay with the that this the decrease in satisfaction, not not happy, but you know, can live with that fact. But then there's an interesting side fact that, that can seem like good news is that the chances of divorce though also declines. And certainly, you know, my situation was a great example that I we would definitely not have made it very far down that road had I not had children and not been clear and that there was a very serious and real risk of trashing my children had I left again, you know, when without when when the personal safety was off the table and and I was looking at, you know, different things that were really, really challenging, the fact that I had children certainly kept me in the marriage. So the chance of divorce also declines now, of course, you know, you could make a joke there saying like how wonderful that you're just going to stay together and be miserable, right? That's really not why we got married and had children. So the question that I want to put out for you is, what if we could have both? What if we could have a happy marriage and be happy that we have kids? And that's absolutely what is possible. But you're going to have to go down a different path than the majority of people nowadays and our, our divorce rates talk about how common the path is nowadays of being right and not having peace or, or you know, having that miserable marriage. So the warning I have for you is that I am going to tell you things that will not likely match up with what you see done around you. And I say likely, maybe some of you are in, in situations that you are experiencing and um, you're, you're on that way less traveled, right? And if so, I'd love to hear more about how you got there. But uh, this is about being right, um, the looking at, you know, do I want to be right or do I want to have peace? Because there are some attitudes I'm going to ask you to look at that contribute to the conflict that parents are having nowadays. And if you are not willing to look at them, then you can be in the situation of choosing between being right or having peace, you know, having a peaceful, joyous marriage. But I want to look at helping you be right and have peace. So marriages are strained like never before. And of course, you know, one of the many reasons is lack of support for the family. And lack of support for the family is, I, I could lump under that so many things, you know, extended families, not being there, being in brand new communities, the working that much more and that much more away from our families, because even if a few generations back, both the mom and, and the dad have always worked, but and many times they were both working, you know, even from the home or, or close by in the, a local village, you know, local um, town, those type of things. So lots of challenges for lack of support for the family and things like social media have ramped up that problem. Higher expectations of individuals than ever before. And I think it's just insane how this perfect storm has happened. At the same time that we have people parenting with less and less support than ever before, we have the, the concept of super mom, right? And this concept of mom doing everything and, and you know, running the kids to 7,000 activities. When you go back a couple generations, moms were running their kids nowhere, right? Uh, a lot of times if, you know, moms weren't even necessarily driving um, and that the pace was just so much saner. But that idea of super mom, you know, everyone wants to have their Ivy League child and a lot of pressure to have those perfect kids. At the same time, we have the concept of super dad and, and growing ideas about what that should look like too. So not only do we have higher expectations of individuals, but we actually also have higher expectations of marriage. And many of us don't even realize this unless it's, you know, 
for me it had to be pointed out because we we grow up and we assume things are like or have been the way they are now unless we hear otherwise well the fact of the matter is we now expect to be in love too and you go back a couple of generations and a marriage was seen much more like a partnership and the idea of romantic love staying in particular was was just not expected in the same level and those expectations are really challenging so i want you to think a little bit about how your co-parenting situation arose because if you can and again if you can suspend your disbelief for a minute because some of what I'm going to say, and I'd really love to hear your reactions, but, and it's one of the things I love about a webinar as opposed to an in-person presentation, it makes it really easy for you to give your feedback. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of this is not, especially what many of us were raised with. So what if what you think has been going on with your partner isn't what's been going on? You know, And, and I'll explain a little bit more as we go through this. But just before saying one piece of information that is fascinating and can really help open up your willingness to examine your own stories and your own thoughts about what's been going on with you and your partner. Did you know that recently there's been some fascinating, the, the whole world of neuroscience is wonderful, just exploding on all sorts of levels. And one of the fascinating things is that they have found that memories are not facts. I'm not going to go into that in any detail but i want to let you know that that is one of the many developments that's been fascinating so what it means is that people are that memories are created not in the the photo snapshot at the moment way that we used to think that instead there's lots more um even interpretation in the moment as well as recreation of memories and things like that anyways what i'm leading up to is this the latest fascinating thing that i have learned in the last year about our brains is that there literally is a part of our brain called by the neuroscientists who are involved with um, the, the studies of creating it or I mean of, of discovering this phenomenon they actually stay in both sides of the brain and realize that when we ha have something happen to us this part of our brain called the interpreter when something happens its job is to make a cohesive story of what happened the fascinating thing is that if you take a, a electrode, hook it up to someone, force a movement, and then ask them what happened, that interpreter will come up with a story. And that's one of the ways they started cracking this belief that, that you know, again, this is a kind of an extension, this memories aren't, aren't facts, and, and that we actually do a lot of creative storytelling. Um, They've also likened this to having a spin doctor in your brain. And the two doctors in particular, Dr. Michael Gazinga, and I think it's Antonio Damasio, um, Gazaniga, sorry. Uh, I'm going to share one of their quotes in a moment, but they're at the forefront of that movement of studying and, and then explaining about this wild situation. Because when you understand, as, as they say, that the left, brain weaves a story in order to convince itself and you that's in full control. That interpreter, which is the part of the left brain that they're talking about, is really trying to keep our personal story together. And to do that, we have to learn to lie to ourselves. When you have that concept in your mind that, that not everything you think is true, this has powerful ramifications for us as parents because when we're looking at our kid and thinking our kid is bad, our child is willful, our child is what, you know, wrong, etc. This concept of realizing, wow, I've got a part of my brain that's trying to make a cohesive story of, about everything and is fascinating. There's a really good reason for this interpreter and there's some really powerful positives about it, but it's really worth knowing and worth um, watching out for how that's showing up in your life in negative ways. So, in my opinion, if this is a brand new concept for you, you have already got tremendous value and I hope you feel the same because when you get just that idea to start questioning your own narratives and that narrative includes, you know, I'm a bad mom, I'm uh, never going to have what I want. Like, there's all sorts of levels to how that interpreter is unhelpful. By the way, um, another the fact is, and, and I just had the curiosity thought, I have to find out the reticular activation, how it 
where the interpreter actually is in our brain. But there's a part of our brain called the reticular activation um, center. And its purpose is to be like Google in our eyeballs. Google, you input a word and suddenly Google narrows down the zillions of websites into the ones that they feel are most relevant. That's exactly what a reticular activation system does. And it also feeds in. So when your left brain is telling you a story that you're a bad mom, then your reticular activation will kick into gear to look for that proof. And so the same if you're saying that your co-parent is is lazy or something like that, right? So all about men. It is again because I said my my audience is new majority of moms looking at dads, you know, and, and dealing with heterosexual moms in a co heterosexual co-parenting situation, whether together or apart. And I will though briefly mention one of the myths. Of course, they, there are myths about that men have about women as well. Um, just notice the order got backwards here, but men should be more involved is the first myth I'm going to talk about. Men are lazy, men don't care, and men should know what we want. So the first one that I want to talk about is that men should be more involved. And it is fascinating because there, it is a, a pervasive idea. And I'm not actually arguing that they shouldn't be more involved in the sense that, that this isn't a positive evolutionary or a change. You know, it's not direct evolution. It's like our conscious choice. But, but whether we're consciously directing evolution or not, it's great to have dads more involved. and. I 100% support that, so I want to be clear on that. But if you think about it, um, getting a little bit ahead of myself, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and say that in one one second. But okay. so men should be more involved. First off, so I I want to be crystal clear. I'm not disagreeing with men being 50% responsible for children and and all of that. But there's a couple things that I want to say. First off. I want you to think about the concept that being equal doesn't mean the same. And it is something I was raised, as so many of you were, with you know the concept of, of feminism. And if you identify as a feminist, I do not want to – well, I just want to open you up to another, another way of looking at things. That's what I want to do because I grew up with you know, a mom who – we even what children's music we had was like this free to be you and me and it was all about gender equality and guys playing with dolls and all that and first off that just didn't work when I tried to do that with my kids but equal doesn't mean the same there is no question that men and women are equally responsible and and need to navigate how to co-parent well in the, the new millennium for sure but I want you to be clear that equal does not mean the same and keep that in mind when you're looking at this so I want you to think about, when you're thinking about that men should be more involved, giving guys time to catch up. I'd love for you to enter in the chat, please. How involved were you with your, was, was your father involved with your parenting? And how, you know, what was your dad, like, for example, my father, the first time he ever had anything to do with the diaper, and he had four flipping kids. And the first diaper I understand he ever got up close and personal with was his grandson, right? So definitely not very involved at all. And when I delivered this presentation in per person, one person in the audience indicated that their um, father actually had anything. Oh my goodness, now someone can't hear. Now, interesting, someone said they can't hear, and I responded even though it was a private one. What I would suggest is a lot of times shutting down your anything else going on in your background, and if you have someone else at home who is using up bandwidth, sometimes that makes a difference. But sometimes it's just a matter of backing out and, and coming back on. Um, okay, so yeah, giving, so I love, like SS is saying, definitely not as involved as my mom, but he was there. Yeah, you know, that's fabulous. Um, the fact of the matter is that dads oftentimes, the vision of what a good mom and a good mom, dad, have changed substantially. And if you are patient with your, your guy and or at least when you're looking at him and, and you're disappointed that he's not doing something, 
realizing that he often has been his own role model um, of what a great dad is, or he's looking at the dads around him or, or that type of thing. Um, arguably, and this is partly why I gave you the picture of the cat and the, the dog, the neither nurture or nature has equipped, equipped men as well as us, I would argue, for parenting historically. And I don't, again, I don't mean to say that a guy can't be a fabulous, you know, single dad, fabulous co-parent or, or that type of thing. But, for example, men, biologically, when we make jokes about men not being able to focus on two things at once, well, there really is some truth to biologically a drive where they need to, um, needed historically to be able to track a deer, for example, and focus on the deer and ignore everything else. Now, we as women needed to be able to take care of the children uh, while picking berries, while nurturing the relationships that we could grow on. Now, interesting, I've seen another message. Oh, interesting. Okay, I think I might know. Haha. -ha. I might know what's happened. Sorry, I saw that there was a note about the slides, too, um, being in the way. Hopefully that's better now. But I am confused why someone could see the dog on the left. Um, so, and, and thank you for the comment earlier about, yes, the tech, technology, we're slaves to it, and it sure can be challenging times, at times. Um, so that does not mean, though, that, that your guy can't parent in his own way but and can't be an equal parent. But... And, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but as I, I mentioned later, it's one of the many reasons why we need to allow our co-parent to parent the way that they parent, because a guy will naturally do things differently, and literally there's biological reasons for that. So, so I'll get into that, and even biological benefits. I'll get into that later. So the other thing is to, to really so. Focus on the fact that it's not your individual man's fault. That yeah, you know, women. I don't. I cannot overemphasize the fact that you are parenting in the most insane situation ever, and and your own expectations for yourself and the ones that you're in, you know, picking up from other places and the lack of support and that it's insane. The problem is when we get into a painful place, we tend to want to blame, right? What if it's not your individual man's fault? And what if you seen it as his fault is going to dig you into a deeper hole? Because the next thing you know, you can end up being a single parent and then you don't even have the financial backing, even if that's all you feel your, your guy's actually showing up for. And without a doubt, despite the myths I'm, I'm busting with, with guys, many women, the majority of women nowadays in from what I've seen, are in situations where you and your, your guy are not parenting well together and he's not pulling with you and, and you genuinely have a tough situation. But it, I encourage you to at least consider that it's not your individual man's fault, that he didn't get married to you and as he put the ring on your finger, say, I'm going to be a lazy deadbeat dad and see how much strain she can take, right? You know, keeping that in mind, can really help you lower the pressure, which is profound and really critical. Not that you chose your sex. Like, it's one of the things I want you to, to consider. And, of course, nowadays there's even some latitude there. But for the most part, you didn't choose your sex, right? And you are in the situation you're in because of your situation, which includes your birth. The solution is to work with reality and not to blame, blame your guy for it, as I said. And I really want to inspire you that the truth of the matter is you get working on understanding this stuff and shifting things with, with your partner so that you guys are working well together. You can actually return to a place where you're grateful for being the primary parent because without a doubt, us women are the primary parents and that is challenging for sure. Um, and I was going to, to say something about the fact of the matter is that we, we want it done our way for a reason, and I'm not actually using this to justify ultimately staying in that place because it's really damaging to insist on everything being done our way. But the fact of the matter is we know, for example, we're much more empathetic with our kids and things like that that are important. So imagine getting to a place where you're grateful for being the primary parent. 
Now, I'm aware I'm going to need to speed this up a little bit. I do, I am guilty of putting too much into the presentation. So I'm going to go quickly through this next bit. But men are lazy. Love this image of a guy watching TV because, my goodness, could my marriage have been more palatable um, much more quickly if I had got the concept that men are not lazy? What if instead they aren't lazy, but they are misunderstood? And the fact of the matter is, when you think of that guy watching TV, I'd love, please tell me in the chat if you understand why men watch TV. With, with taking the, the answer of he's lazy out of the equation, what is the positive reason that he watches TV? And I'm going to leave it for one second and see what your answers are. Um, what if men just respond differently than women to criticism? Because it is fascinating that, in truth, women will respond to criticism. We don't like it, but we tend to buck up and try harder. Men actually shut down. Um, and what if men are hardwired to focus on one thing at a time? I already mentioned that, and they absolutely are. Um, so some people are saying the guy needs downtime to not stress, distraction from all, all the other responsibilities, to decompress from stress, to relax. True. What I want to add is that what your man is doing is he's actually building testosterone. And it's not like TV is the only way a guy can build testosterone either. And when you've got a guy who's in a good cycle of feeling that he can win with his woman, which, you know, I get that this is, is a challenge to get your head around. And, and at first it can seem like flick. You mean on top of all this, I now got to, you know, change how I'm reacting with him. But the fact of the matter is that guys um, do build their testosterone different ways, including watching TV. It's not the only way. But if you understand that, wait a minute, my guy is taking some time to build his testosterone so that he's ever ready to protect us, right, amongst other things, that men do have a real drive to be always ready to be able to protect you, then that can help you at least, if nothing else, say, okay, he's not being lazy. He literally is trying to meet a biological need right now. How can I get my need met right now while understanding and, and not being critical of him? So, so enough said about that. Um, but, yeah, the, the fact of the matter is that them being focused on one thing at a time absolutely helps them to take a break because they can ignore all the mess in, in the living room while they're watching TV. Um, they also truly don't see things we see. Like they don't, they'll step over something, even though that they obviously saw it enough to step over it, they aren't consciously recognizing it in the same way. Um, and what if men can teach us about having reasonable expectations? There's a, a woman, I can tell you about her book at the end if you're curious, but she's got a great book called All Joy, Don't, or All, All, um, Joy No Fun, and it's Jennifer Sr., and it's fabulous because it's it, one of the things she suggests is that we quit assuming that our guy should also try and meet our unrealistic expectations and, in truth, learn from him about dropping things. Anyways, another myth, men don't care. So what if the opposite were true? What if men are actually very responsive to women? What if they feel... That's if they feel they can win, and, and as soon as you start getting mad at your guy and getting discouraged and misunderstanding what's going on, he's in a lose situation, and that's when you get that guy, you know, he hands over his ears, trying, he just wants out of that situation. Um, it's a cultural norm to ridicule men, and I'd sure love to be part of changing that norm because it's horrific that, that we do not it's not publicly acceptable to make fun of any other group in the same way as it is about to make fun of men and make fun of dads for you know, not being prepared. And we'll talk more about why they aren't prepared when they go out the door in a minute. How do you react when you feel misunderstood? You know, if we're going back to you like, well, why is it saying men don't care? The fact of the matter is guys just shut me down when they're feeling criticized. So it's not that they don't care. They just, they're biologically programmed to avoid that uh, no win situation and you know maybe that's because if they were willing to try harder in situations that weren't clear wins you know maybe we wouldn't exist as a species because they would have gone after a deer that wasn't attainable or something like that don't know the biological reason but they do react differently and i really like to encourage you if you want motivation to consider this more it's is you know, because I realize that if you are fried and your guys been sitting watching TV 10 hours a day and stuff, and then 
there, there are situations where guys are, are really tuned out and or you know doing genuinely jerky things no question um but i want you to consider that you might have a role in all this because i'll tell you that's where the power was in, in my life and that's how you end up with you know a responsive son father and make the most of your situation so the last myth quickly is men should know what we want and love this picture because you look at that doubt on his face and he's kind of hopeful that maybe he might have got it right well, if you think about why should they, you know, and I totally thought men should know what I wanted and I was critical of my ex on his attempts at presence at first and I then, you know, no surprise necessarily, a lot of guys will try, well, shouldn't even say a lot, some guys will try harder, but mine did shut down for the large part, did not give presence for the rest of our marriage because that instead of me knowing how to appreciate the gift and then direct him towards what I wanted, I, I expected that he would know better and really treated him as wrong for giving me the wrong gift. The fact of the matter is they aren't women. And if you think of a time, all of us, you think of a time when you wanted to please someone and you didn't know how to do it and blew it, like, I guarantee you have a time. The fact of the matter is, as I was saying, our reaction affects our willingness to try next time. So. The, and and when you're thinking about men should know what we want, if you take the should out, it all changes, doesn't it? Because then you imagine having a partner who is actually hardwired to, men are actually meant to be real production and real like do one thing, complete that cycle, do another thing, so that is that single focus. But your two-year-old boy has 30 times the testosterone you do, and testosterone gets used up in getting things done. So what if you could take the should out, don't think if your man should know what you want, start getting good about asking for what you want and, and being in a positive frame of mind and let him use that testosterone that he's given 30 times the supply as a little two-year-old. Don't know how much more they have as full-grown men. So last part of this section is why if your co-parenting challenges are there to serve your highest good? And that's again what I said earlier, but I really want to drive that home. One quick myth that men, dads may believe is that they are a better parent. And that often will come because the kids will listen and behave better with them, two reasons. But the biggest reason for this is that kids will act up worst with the parent they're most comfortable with. And man, was that helpful for me to learn when my kids were little because I definitely got the gears and, and got the direct message from my guy that he thought I was the worst parent because the kids listen better to him helped a lot when I realized the kids feel safe with me in a different way. But the other thing is men also, because they don't have the same drive to be, and they don't meet the same need for empathy and, and things like that, um, they can be a lot stricter. And as a result, you know, that encourages kids to listen more to them. But, but yeah, dads, if you've been saying the story to yourself that your wife's not a good mom because kids don't listen to her, it's, it's much more complex than, than that. Um, so keeping the co-parenting bond strong, um, I emphasize this because a strong bond equals less conflict. It also means that the conflicts you do have will be resolved more easily. Imagine going back to when you first met and, you know, some low conflict happened. It, you just, your desire to please each other and do things for each other, which is actually all based on alignment. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but hopefully you've all heard me talk about alignment and heard one of my webinars focused on it. All of this equals a much happier, healthier family that, that blows through conflicts so much easier. And it just avoids a lot of that, right? So how do you keep that bond strong? Learning about gender, which for the most part I told you all I'm going to tell about that. But um, alignment, matchmaking, building support, focus, the way you talk about him or her, and date night with a twist. So learning about gender. Just going to say a couple quick additional comments. First off, is that peace begins with you. And as women, we are literally given the gift of being the relationship expert in our marriage. And for the most part, the woman is it. And if you are able to um, you know, gain support, is something we're going to talk about too. If you're able to turn things around so that you don't feel resentful, but you instead say, oh, okay, well, what if nobody's been wrong? What if we can start shifting this and really peace begins with you and you 
often are the one who's going to need to make the changes just because your gender is given the gift of being better with relationships, communication, emotions, etc. Often, not always. What if instead of you know the men are, are bad concept, which and and substitute women are bad for sure if you're a guy listening. Um, what if our culture hasn't kept up with the changes and the sexes are at war? And I believe that fervently, although I did not believe that in the slightest when I entered my marriage. Again, what about instead of men being bad? What about parent if what about if parenting has changed to make a doable job seem impossible? So that women are blaming men. And understandably, as I said, I mean, we're, we're stressed, we're in pain. And when we don't understand what's going on, it is normal to look at our partner. What's the role of the spin doctor in all this? You know, again, that 50 plus percent divorce rate. What if no one is to blame? And I really, if you are still holding on to some thoughts of, about your partner being to blame, I want to ask you if you can think of a stress free reason to to keep that thought because it really is helpful. And with your kids too, right? When you're looking at your kid and thinking your kid's being willfully defiant, that's gonna take you down a whole different path. Remember we talked about those two, less, two paths above, I want you on the path less traveled because it's phenomenally more fun, more effective, everything. So alignment, I'm not gonna go into it in detail, but I'm just gonna say a couple high level things. The long and short, the picture is, is, is a, um, an apple falling to depict psychological gravity because alignment is just as powerful as gravity. We used to be able to count on as a parent. We can't count on it nowadays, although we can be harness it. The same with our co-parenting partner. Um, you want your co-parenting partner to want to cooperate with you and behave like and, and for you. So doing little things like making sure you're sending out the invitation to exist in your presence, that twinkle in your eye, Making sure that you're sending out in, um, make a clear message of taking care of each other because, of course, we get into a place of, of you know, we're resentful of all the things that we're not getting. But when we're understanding it's not our partner's fault and we can force ourselves to shift, of course, the perspective shift can help inspire us, which is a better way to change your behaviors when you're inspired, to, to offer to take care of the other person. Um, fascinating all the ways that being a couple is more powerful when it's going well because even things that taking care of each other we are actually mentally meant to divide our um, knowledge up and there's some really fascinating information about that that I won't get into again this could be a course and will be a course but a little ways down the line so another thing about that taking care of, of each other is just giving her a person that message you know you can lean on me we all seek that and we get into a co-parenting situation where we're feeling challenged and we can pull back those arms and that gets us into more conflict quickly and makes a conflict harder to resolve. Matchmaking. This is one of the things too that I'm just briefly mentioning that hopefully it'll, it'll spur you to think about this if it's an issue for you. In many cases, the primary parent, and it's not always the mom, but the primary parent has a role to help their child to be more deeply aligned with the co-parent. A lot of times guys will feel, and again, I'm using guys, but with whoever the less dominant parent is, less primary parent is, can feel out of the loop. And if you want your co-parent to take that much more responsibility and to be that much more involved, make sure that they're clear how important they are to the kids and the kids are clear of how important this person is because that actually even evokes caregiving um, instincts in, in your father. So you want to make sure he's not alienated, that he's really included in the family. And that can mean, you know, when the kids, if they start making strange, you know, you can do all sorts of matchmaking things, including pointing out the ways that they're like each other. And, and yeah, I'd love to talk about this but I will let it be that for now um, building support and I for now I'm going to let the go because I'll talk about more in the next um, section but in that again is also a whole webinar in and of itself your focus and this is so important because when you're looking at that co-parenting the bond and building it what you focus on expands and it's really challenging because it's really common that we get 
focused, you know, like I said, we've got that reticular activation system. And if you start seeing, like maybe you can even remember when you started seeing the cracks in your marriage or, or with your child or whatever, the problem is, you know, very quickly we are biologically driven to look for the negative because if we didn't notice that saber-toothed tiger and instead stay focused on those beautiful flowers, we wouldn't exist as a species. But we have the power to train our, our focus, which is really important because there is not a saber-toothed tiger out in most of our lives. Part of the focus that I want you to look at is the long range. You think of an ocean liner or a big cruise ship like this, they don't turn on a dime, right? And if you are able to focus on momentum and little changes that get you in the right direction, that ocean liner that, or in this case, the cruise ship a thousand miles down the road can be on a different, or down the ocean, not the road, but it can be on a different, different continent, right? Really, really powerful. Um, so why does focus matter? There, there's a few different things that I want to say, but one is a lot of reciprocity is when someone does something nice for us, we want to do something nice back. Um, and what if our resentment isn't even based on the truth? That's why I want you to keep thinking about that interpreter, right? And what if our partner was operating in a predictable way for his gender? So again, what if nobody was wrong or bad? Um, so I want you in terms of, of your focus to try to remember why you chose your partner. And that's true even you, if you may leave him because you want to model tolerance and acceptance for your children, right? What are your co-parent strengths? Because, and, and the fact of the matter is, again, if you can get yourself into a place of assuming your co-parent didn't, uh, didn't set out to become this, this, whatever they're showing up for in your life, but you know, this argumentative, lazy person, whatever. If you instead get curious about what's going on, it changes everything. And if you look at, you know, how is your co-parenting partner supporting you right now? Um, if you're, and, and I'm saying that because honestly, what I see so often, if you are struggling hard as a mom, getting rid of the guy can make it worse in so, so many ways. And one of the ways is even just the financial piece, if nothing else, and the conflict. No doubt, in most cases, if you aren't on this path less traveled, the conflict typically escalates, right? So now you've got kids who aren't listening and, and you and your ex are full on fighting you know, over the kids and that it really gets challenging. So if you can say, okay, just for today, my partner is, is supporting me with a roof over my head while I figure this out, that can really help you. And I would like you, if you're contemplating leaving, the most powerful, one of, like, just insanely powerful. In the year before I left my husband, the first time when I had started going to counseling and al -Anon and doing different things like that, I got the concept from a, a counselor, if you're not leaving today, take it off to the table. So get up in the morning, am I leaving today? If you're not, take it off the table and figure out what you can do today to be happier. That's how I was able to leave and stay gone for four months and, would, and, and then leave a second time 14 years later. That's not the norm at all in these type of marriages, right? People bounce in and out. And, and in both cases, particularly the second time, but even the first time, like I left and, and I felt shaky, but I was clear I could do this, right? And that's that getting to a place where you're strong enough to leave is critical. And you can waste your life on ruminating about whether you're going to stay or go. So talking about your co-parent is, is another critical area. I'd like you to think about, you know, how do you talk about your, your partner? Um, I alluded to earlier the fact that it's culturally okay to make fun of dads and talk about them like they're incompetent, make fun of men. I want you to take the challenge, and I'd love you to put this in the chat box if you're taking it, if you know right away you're going to do it. Don't even jokingly discount your partner. Now, I recently have taken this to another level, which is realizing that um, I am in a dating situation and I have decided that I have like two people that I uh, will say anything processy about trying to figure out things with him because every time I share any doubts and negatives with other people, that puts something into the space. But in this case, assuming you're not saying those type of things to your kids, 
The fact of the matter is when you jokingly discount your partner, it takes, it, it's destructive on many levels. It's horrible modeling. It's horrible modeling of how men are to be treated. You know, and, and for those of you who have sons, like, do you want your son to grow up thinking that, that he's incompetent and, and, you know, because, and I'm not thinking of a joke right off, but this is really interesting because it was one of the ways that my marriage, you know, shut down all that type of stuff. I came in very critical and, and really had, I had horrible modeling for, you know, lots of the things I'm teaching not to do. And because my marriage being so challenged, I challenging, I had to learn not to go there. But also what happened is I started looking around and I could see at least the, the, intent i could see the, the goodness in in other guys trying and, and just well i could also just see that holy camoli like the guys get non-stop criticism in some cases right and then you wonder why the guy even shows up at all let alone shows up less so anyways it's also a horrible example for how differences are to be dealt with right even if you and your co-parenting partner are profoundly on the opposite page on core values um your child, you know, so many families have had situations where their child turned out polar opposite in, than to their beliefs. And, and, you know, with beliefs, they're polar opposites. With lifestyle choices, they're polar opposites. Your child needs some modeling on how profound differences are to be dealt with. It also it puts negative energy into the space, which is why I said I've recently taken the challenge, you know, not to just not to gossip about my partner. Um, and when you remember that the power of focus, you want to focus on what's going right in your relationship. If that's the upward, if you want on the upward spiral and remembering that interpreter, the challenge is we can't have it both ways. On the one hand, you can't put him down in jest for his, his choices and then expect him to step up to, to the plate. Men are very sensitive to not getting into the win situations. And if you are cutting him down and making it, him out to not be that great a father, then you really aren't inspiring him. Whereas again, as women, we don't like it, but we tend to hustle and try. And, and it was powerful. And I do wish I'd known that a lot earlier as well. Um, it also, you can't have it both ways. You can't be close and have a deep romantic connection and, and you know, have your guys showing up and wanting to please you and all that and betray the deepest level of alignment. The deepest level of alignment is the sense of being known. And energetically, if we have any worry that our partner doesn't end up, doesn't profoundly get that we mean well and that we're bumbling, like, cause I totally saw the guys bumble. Like I definitely saw the guys making, doing lots of things wrong, but because the situations were comparatively so much better than the situation I was in, I could see their, their goodness and seeing that goodness is how you that's like a seed you can cultivate and grow and change now it's not good to keep your feelings bottled in so i suggest two things choose one or two people to share with and only share your doubts and your challenges with them and the second one is keep getting help shifting your perspective which will also shift your results because of course that, that latter will help us to form right and the more you shift your perspective and get your results going better the better things will go the last thing I want to say about this is to go on date nights with a twist. And it's so huge that when we get together with our co-parenting partner and we get into the trenches, moms are often very guilty that we want, we, we fall in love with our kids and we're our natural caregiving, which is something that's so much more dominant for us than, than for men. It's one of the reasons why we're naturally often the primary parent kicks in and we want to give our all to our kids. But forgetting our co-parent, it damages the foundation that that caring for our kids is resting on. So it's really critical that we look at that. And I really emphasize fun and novel date time together. Novelty builds dopamine, which actually is what causes us to fall in love. And, and it makes our, it gives us actually, when we are in a great romantic relationship, that in turn can nurture some of our core needs as moms and help us actually be the more able to nurture our kids without burning out. So it, it really can feed us positively. If your marriage falls apart, I want you to think about this because, you know, that's, unfortunately, pain is often, and it is biologically meant to be this way, but pain's a motivator. So if you, Things are just coasting along. 
often you aren't motivated to do anything, especially if you're sure you won't have a divorce. But the fact of the matter is many people are blindsided. And I do, as I was saying, want to encourage you to think about what you're modeling for your kids. So creative dates, I really encourage you, you know, that same old sitting in a restaurant on a Friday night or whatever, even though it's easy, it actually can really encourage you to get into conflict, actually, because there's nothing exciting going on. So if you are going out, you know, at least bring fun lists of questions or things like that. Um, to to liven it up spend some money and i say that because the cost of divorce or the the cost of you being miserable and then happy you know with and even if that you just go down with numbing you know, with you know alcohol food um whatever you can actually blow a lot of money doing those things so spend some money and and make your dates creative um and get help if you're not able to go and enjoy each other because often you get to that point um I, I two last quick slides that I just stick in here. One is I really want to encourage you to consider as, as women when we're getting so stressed out, and especially when we're not taking some responsibility for shifting that ship and, and lifting some help and, and getting to a better place. Sometimes the last thing we want to do is get romantic, you know, and, and be physically intimate, but that that's such a chicken and egg one because literally biologically that that having sex will help men kick into being more nurturing and loving and it, it is often chicken and egg too that, that if we're waiting to feel it we tend not to go there so that's a whole discussion of itself but it absolutely has a place in this um co-parenting webinar for sure and i do want to encourage you just again to inspire you to get curious most women suck at listening to men and i absolutely was one of them we misunderstand um we think men are shallow because we actually don't understand how we shut down their sharing so that's all i'm going to say about that hopefully as i said i've got you um inspired on a number of levels um yeah oh and i i am just going to quickly answer something that ss is saying you mentioned one of the drawbacks of leaving your partner was financial yes absolutely the partner is responsible financially no matter whether married or divorced the fact of the matter is most women who leave the stats are actually sad because most women who leave are um poor financially have less money than they did before right so you can take them to court and get the you know, money that's owed and maybe if you're in betters. Well, part of the reason, though, for working on all this while you're together is that even then, if you separate, the chances are of you more, much more amicably resolving things and, and, you know, even getting more support are so much stronger. So hopefully that, that clarifies that, yeah, I'm not like absolutely the man is responsible. And I am 100% against the fact that statistically men, um, and when when women leave statistically usually they, they are less well off financially so how to handle co-parenting conflicts um sorry, i'm gonna finish up with one last comment to to that private question was that um the fact of the matter is that again you know i'm not i'm basically just saying look at how your situation right now it's going to be challenging enough all the normal separation things, but what things can you handle now in advance, especially while you're still debating whether you're going to stay or go, so that by the time you go, you're in just that much stronger position. Okay, so how to handle co-parenting conflicts. I'm going to talk about um, expectations, the gift that each parent brings, spreading the load, how to ask for help, and disagreements. So expectations. I really like the analogy of a two-legged stool. Because I, what I see nowadays is, and you know, there's a lot of one-legged stools out there, and a lot of moms like really struggling. And I get it, and I've done the, the single parent route, and really found that very challenging as well. I get it. Um, and when you have just a co-parenting partner and you, you know, yeah, you can balance. Yeah, you can make it work. But the fact of the matter is if you ask how strong is your foundation, it's an awful lot stronger if you have a three or more legged stool, right? That's just a lot more powerful, powerful position to be. So there's, there's questions to ask yourself. And one is, is you know, are your expectations of, of your 
co-parenting partner reasonable? Because the fact of the matter is, again, it's one of the reasons why I'm trying to encourage you to look at, at some of the genuine gender differences, because sometimes your partner may not even be good at the thing that you're wanting them to do, and maybe you haven't thought of other possible ways to get that need met. And sometimes uh, I know that there's lots of situations where the masculine co-parenting partner is willing to put some money at you know, hiring some help or something like that. And that super mom myth and really damaging concept can keep moms from wanting, from feeling okay with doing, you know, hiring some help, for example. Um, you, so size expectations of you aren't reasonable either. I do want to just keep nailing the fact that I, I get that. But the option can be a one-legged stool or it, it can be building that village. And we're going to talk more about that in just a couple of minutes because I really encourage you to start building more of a village and not just really leaning on your co-parent. So looking at the gifts of each parent, I talked a little bit <clears throat> about the, the fact that the masculine you know, genuinely shows up differently. There are genuine and, and that affects our kids' biology, which is so exciting and, and fascinating. And this I can thank Dr. John Gray for sharing this information on the show with me, and it was a life-changing interview. Um, respect. Respecting the masculine, I realized actually in that interview is available on our website too, so I always check that out afterwards. Respecting the masculine, respecting that he does genuinely parent differently. The example that, that Dr. Gray gave that is just so brilliant. You know how, like, as women, we walk out the door when we have, well, baby for sure, but, you know, just in general, we prepare for things, right? Why do women have purses, men have wallets? Well, women, we're looking for... Amongst other things, we have a different relationship to safety than men. There's really fascinating ways that we are different that will really that really resonate when you dive into it more. So a guy will walk out the door with his kids, with his wallet. You know, he may have brought sunscreen, may not have, may have brought, um, you know, put two um, coats on, may not have. But the interesting thing is, a man is actually biologically designed to challenge kids, to kind of stretch them, to push them. Is one of the reasons why kids like suck up their emotions around their dads because the, the dad's role historically has not been to help kids get in touch with their emotions the way that, that women do. Um, so when your dad, your guy goes out the door with just his wallet and, and that's it and the kids, they're actually off on an adventure. He's teaching them something different. He's teaching them how to deal with challenge, how to deal with adverse conditions. And I know that can seem crazy because we're like the adverse condition could be avoided if you just bring a coat. Now, if you understand that there's nothing wrong with what he's doing in the sense that if you were him, that would seem likely normal too. And I guarantee if you were exactly your partner, it would seem fine to you, right? So then, then suddenly you can approach it differently if they're not wearing sunscreen and that's, you know, for most of us, that's an absolute must. You'll stop for a second, put the sunscreen on them or, or ask him if you put the sunscreen on and if you've got a nice wind cycle going, your, your guy's chances are, you know, you've got that good romance, romantic connection going, you've got the situation where he's clear he can win, then chances are he'll do it that much more easily. The fact of the matter is that you also just getting that, oh, you know, okay, you know, that's just him being him really helps you to not go to that, that blame place, which gets everyone in, in, in a bad place. And definitely this was one of my many, many things that I had to learn the hard way. Um, it's fascinating the unique ways he benefits your children's biology, and you can hear more about that on, on the interview, but literally your children will have a different biological response to being around guys, and they are needing masculine role models in their life, absolutely. And yeah, I see someone asked about asking questions, by all means, please do. Um, so that just knowing that if you're a single parent, it's actually really critical that you find some male role models to get into your child's life, right? And I briefly mentioned this earlier, but men actually definitely have the superiority of taking time for themselves. And if we are nurtured and feeling good about ourselves and, and in a good place with our guy, 
we can be okay with that. But when we're burnt out and fried and not getting that we're part of the problem in the first place and that, that, that we can help steer that ship a different direction, then his superiority of taking time for himself can be, you know, real rage inducer. I get that. But actually instead, as Jennifer Senior talks about, you know, be great if we would get a little more inspired to find ways to carve out a little bit of time for ourselves and when you're in a positive co-parenting situation your partner will support that in fact i i posted this a while ago on our facebook page with something about you know a dad who was just like beside himself he couldn't get why his wife would not take time for herself um Dan's asking about same gender parents, and I'm not sure what your question is in this case. So ask me what the question is, okay? And I do not propose, purport to be an expert on same gender parents, but I'd happily tell you what I do know, okay? So spreading the load, this is like so, so, so critical. Um, your village supports you, it reduces the pressure of, on you and your mate, it reduces things like peer orientation when you've got. Um, more people involved in your child's lives than when they're teens and they have a natural drive to push away from you than you, um, they, they will have other adults who have similar values that they will learn from. Um, and it helps teach your values in some fascinating ways. Um, I like to share set of pictures from my so when the kids after we my husband and I got back together and I was you know still very much in that time of should I stay should I go um because within a year things got quite challenging again and, and really looking at what could I keep doing to be happier a young woman um who I hired for help so I could go running after school Danielle came into my our lives and has been in our lives ever since. She actually just recently had her baby 20 years after my son. So that's my son dancing with her. You know, so wonderful for teaching values because, again, looking at that peer orientation, looking at my kids with older people, looking at them, you know, taking part in family, uh, in cultures, right, in traditions, and those are so important. Um, and they helped me with all the hall setup because I was the hall manager, and so that's in cult passing on values and, and getting them to, to also, you know, um, contribute in various ways. Um, the crazy thing is prior to having kids, I sucked at friends, even friendships. I had very few friends left in my life and I had, was very shut down in very many ways. And another picture I sometimes show is what of my dad's group, right? Because I, since my, separation three years ago and soon to be divorced have built a dance community here now genuinely and um well recognized as having a real gift for friendship and it is one of the many ways that that co-parenting challenge that that at times looked beyond endurance was the best thing that could happen to me because of how dramatically happier i am now um and Oh, I am, okay, and Cheryl's got a question that basically I get into in a few minutes, and then I may get into it again at the end, um, so I will wait on that, but it also includes, so when you're building a village, it includes the less functional, and again, this is something I can just say high level, but my family have some pretty serious cracked pots in them, to say the least, and before I got married, and for the first Number of years of my marriage, I was really challenged with getting along with my family, really triggered. The interesting thing is, and I, you know, it took some time for me even to believe I could get there, but finally, slowly but surely, surely doing the healing and, and growing I needed to do to be able to accept these people, it shows your children unconditional love because when you actually cut off family members, inadvertently and i've seen this even from watching other family members who have even cut me off because of some of the crazy dynamics my parents are divorced and there's some pretty high drama has gone on there to say the least and i well i was debating i'll go ahead and share the one thing but my, my dad married one of my babysitters right so that can just give you a, a glimpse anyways um so so i've been cut off by a family member more often than not and, and that 
whole branch because of keeping some contact with my father. But the interesting thing is when you don't cut off family members, it shows acceptance for differences, even if you need to limit contact. And I absolutely, I don't stay at my father's place and, and see some really serious issues there. Um, but I absolutely am able to keep speak kindly and able to be empathetic and my kids have had some benefits still from having you know this person in in their life which is really profound um it models how to deal with the crack pots around them and you know one of the reasons i had so few friends by the time i had kids is because i couldn't deal with anything less than perfection but the irony was i was so far from perfection but of course why did i quickly succumb to postpartum depression after having kids is because finally I couldn't run anymore and I had a lot of depressed thoughts. It also helps your kids with the ways that they are crackpots and it's the craziest thing. In the process of learning to accept and love all these different people in my life, um, and it, like I said, it doesn't mean I, I'm seeking a lot of contact with all of them by any means, but that has done so much with helping me to find self-love. So it, it's really, really powerful. So um, also enlisting, I know we've got a few more things to talk about, so I need to keep moving fast, but enlisting your co-parents help. So obviously you get agreement if you can, and I want to talk about that right off. There's a whole course on, on how to ask, and basically I'm going to tell you the website at the end in case you want to check it out more, but I have, despite doing all, all sorts of, relationship courses online and, and a number of in-person um, weekend ones and with like Dr. John Gray, Alison Armstrong, Satya and Suzanne Raja. Um, Donna Toski, who I'm, I will give you her website at the end in case you want to check her out more, she does so much to help women learn how to ask and ask in a way that gets us a yes. And I know it can seem intense to have to find some energy on the front end to do this but the fact of the matter is if you do figure it out how to ask um, for what you want like imagine having a magic wand where you could ask and, and have a dramatic higher chance of getting what you want um so i am going to give you a couple pointers about it. one is to take responsibility for the energy you begin begin to the request that you bring to the request um resentment leads to a no right so if you are in a place where you're really resentful because you're so stressed out, and I get it, totally understand that. But the fact of the matter is, if you go back to that men being sensitive to the wind and literally having a, a, a conservation of energy thing going on, that I think has to do with them being a hunter. But however it goes, you know, historically, um, if you think back to that, that if you are already resentful, then then it, feels like a loss right away, right? Feels like a no-win situation. So appreciation is like gas. Um, you can resent this fact too, right? Because again, if that's where I want you to take some, some responsibility for finding some ways, and I'd love to talk to you about this for how to get some more support so you're not feeling so fried, right? Build that village and, and change your perspective so that you're not feeling so resentful because literally when you're clear when something is done and you kind of complete the cycle by thanking the man, it's super, super powerful. Um, but you, so you can either resent this fact or you can be wildly happy and successful with your man, but really I could say man, the man in your life. So show him the win and remember that your kids are watching you. Now this is one other thing that, that I'm not going to go into in detail, but this is profound, and this is another one of those points. If you just took nothing out of it, the webinar, then this it would be really powerful. Can you let it be done your partner's way? And and I'm sharing, you know, this, this tongue-in-cheek quote: "As long as everything is exactly the way I want it, I'm totally flexible." The problem is, you know, I grew up watching my mom and and be frustrated with my dad for vacuuming the kitchen floor with the floor attachment instead of sweeping it. And it's fascinating because even at the time, it's like, let him do it. Like, why can't he decide? You know, he's, it's interesting. My parents have six university degrees between them. He has three, he has a PhD. Surely he can, you know, vacuum the floor. But the fascinating thing is all these years later, that's actually the way I prefer 
to do it too, even though for the most part, mom's my, my primary um, alignment for sure is with her. But what if your unwillingness to flex on how it's done, what if that actually ends up being a point of contention between you and your children? Because absolutely, without a doubt, if for no other reason than that, I'm supremely grateful that I married the person I married because I was totally my way or the highway on many things, on, on opinions, on how things were done, etc. And that actually was a real divisive thing with my children. Um, or would have been, actually, it's interesting, because I said it was because I was thinking of my mom, because definitely that's been, you know, lots of family challenges because of that. So knowing how and when to ask for advice, um, there are huge pitfalls, pitfalls of having your guy as your sounding board. Um, the questions to ask yourself or things to think about, could you refrain from giving him advice if he was struggling and and you didn't like how things were going or, and or you just wanted to help, right? Um, guys are hardwired to want to fix things. So there is a way to set it up so he can just listen. And part of that involves just telling him, hey, you know, that's the win is just to listen. But I really want to encourage you to consider if you're having conflicts with your co-parenting partner, maybe he's not the guy to bring challenging parenting situations up with, especially too if it, it potentially erodes his view of you, right? Whether that's fair or not, that's where you are at this point. Um, it may not be powerful. So just a couple of other things that um, I, I'm, what it means when a man gives advice, I know I'm trying to put too many things into this. So just to say that, that it is actually interesting if a man gives you advice, they have a different relationship to that. They actually consider that though if they invest, they don't always, but if they invest in giving you an answer and you ignore them, it actually can feel like, well, why do you waste their time, right? So you want to be clear. If you're floating for ideas and you're going to still decide on whether you, you want advice that you are, will take action on. Um, really huge. Like this is, this is just basic great leadership, which is what all this co-parenting stuff is driving you to improve your leadership skills. Involve him from the start if you want his help, right? That's much more powerful for um, getting your guy to give you advice and really be involved, right? Um, and, and to take action. Parenting pushes us, as I said, to be better leaders. Um, so you'd want to reduce the pressure to agree. It's super damaging when we think we have to agree with our co-parenting partner. Um, ask for agreement to not disagree in front of the children if you can reduce conflict in front of the kids so that that's kind of a segue into um what to do with when you don't agree which is the the last major section and i think um what well i'm probably going to just shorten up a couple things here but the fact of the matter is it's how you handle the disagreement that's important it ramps up the pressure substantially if you're not allowed to disagree. As I said, don't disagree in front of the, the children. Winning overall often means being patient in the short to medium term, so that's why focus on the long term. Don't focus on right this minute. Whether or not, you know, even if he's disrespectful to you in that moment, you adding pressure to that and, and getting into a fight right there makes it worse. Um, you want to give your kids role models of respectful disagreement and you, again, they'll get back to um, the biological role. There are times where you're not going to see things the same because you literally have different lenses. And that lens, of course, includes culture and lots of other things. Um, don't erode your guys' authority. And I'm saying that because I do see both happens. I see situations where men are very disrespectful of the woman and, and you know, cutting her down and, and that type of thing. And, um, I also see situations where the women are really cutting the guy down, right? And nobody wins down that road. You end up pulling your kids apart, right? You end up making them feel just yuck. And in truth, that can drive your kids. One of the reasons kids do so poorly in divorce situations is if this dynamic is present, where they don't see respectful modeling of disagreement. And then the kids, when they're feeling pulled apart, it's actually more comfortable to just go attached to another kid or someone else entirely and not a parent. So the solution is, first off, the interesting one is to 
get it figured out yourself in a lot of cases, right? So even Cheryl's question, what do you do when your husband yells, criticizes, belittles, etc.? Brutal, first off, like brutal. It can be really, really hard some of these situations, and I totally get that. Um, I couldn't get agreement to dis to not disagree in front of the children, for example. I couldn't get that basic going. But what I did do over the years is I figured out how to get the kids to listen to me, right, and how to get a good relationship going with them. You get it figured out yourself, and then your partner will often choose to start doing things your way, right? Um, it also, like, again, if you ask yourself that question, right this morning, am I staying, am I going? If you are staying, take it off the table. Like, there's no sense... Do what you can that day, but the fact that that your husband is still you know yelling or criticizing your kids or you, um, if you can't change it, focus on the things you can change. Start expanding that. Look for and I, I'm making myself go ahead because I'm going to talk about empathy in a moment, which is something important to do with your kids. But look for where you can agree because a lot of times your dad, um, the co-parent. You may actually support the reason behind his intent, right? So maybe your guy's being harsh, but you 100% support the fact that he thinks X behavior should be dealt with. And you can acknowledge him for being an active parent, acknowledge him for caring, right? And that goes a long ways to even starting opening up a conversation where you might get some agreement on, on exact behavior. Um, and why is he being harsh or why is he being lenient interestingly enough sometimes guys are being very harsh on the kids because they want to protect the mom and they've got a response that that they can't handle the disrespect so having a conversation about that where you are acknowledging that you see his goodness you see how much it hurts him and how much he cares about them treating you properly that's going to help him hear that you'd like a tweak in how he does it. This is basically like he gave you a present, which is him harshly criticizing your kid, much like him giving you a vacuum when you didn't want a vacuum. Um, if you can acknowledge the good and the win to whatever degree you can give it, then it'll make it easier for him to come alongside you. Um, then see if you can get agreement. Um, if not, you can end up bringing up issues with your kids when your partner isn't around. And you know, a lot of us really want to get our co-parent to back us because we don't feel our power as a parent. And I get that, understand that, and would have gone that route if it had worked with me. But the fact of the matter is sometimes we can be more effective by downplaying things when our partner's around. Or even, like, again, you go back to that separation situation. If your partner's yelling and criticizing the kids, for example, um, and you divorce your influence on what he's doing goes down right so if you instead in the moment can get better at going with the flow if you really can't change that exact moment but then start working on seeing if you can get agreement working on building your relationship and seeing if you can turn that ship right that's often a lot more powerful because the more push energy we bring the more uh, our partners will often push back um so, and definitely empathizing with your kids about, you know, the challenges that they're witnessing, for sure. So separation and divorce, really, mostly I'm saying this, the things that I have talked about before. Um, the fact of the matter is, if you think of wherever you go, there you are. Find ways to change your perspective. Find your power, because I will tell you that I was convinced that if I didn't have my co-parents backing, I couldn't turn things around with my kids, and I did. You can absolutely do it. And you, the power of alignment is so, so profound. I'll mention that really briefly. Look for how you can contribute because the fact of the matter is even with your kids, when they, when you talk about your um, things years from now, like my kids really appreciate when I share how I contributed because we all see that it's more than one person except when, when it's us, we often get really focused on another, right? But when you can focus on where your power lies, where, where you are, um, contributing and look at have you been denying your partner the right to an opinion have you been discounting their contribution and all of this if you don't learn it it's going to taint your next relationship um so a couple more things 
to say is um, focus is again key, and this is for divorce and separation. You often can't change what's happening at the other house, but when you focus on what you can change, then what you can change increases. The other thing is that your child's strongest alignment is the values that they will adopt. Um, and so basically what I'm saying is that they will adopt your values if they've got a stronger alignment with you. So that is really important. And I really emphasize things like you want to make sure you're having self-compassion for yourself about the challenging situation. But um, when I said you can't change what's happening at the other house, also though it's powerful to handle issues. Like you might see something that's court worthy that you need to go to court for, but handle that separately. Um, okay, so in terms of what we covered, and then I will get to questions on why co-parenting is such a hot topic. We talked about that. We talked about keeping co-parenting the bond strong, common co-parenting conflicts, separation after uh, co-parenting after separation and divorce. And I'm realizing I did pull a slide that was talking about for blended families. One of the things that I see really challenging whether or not your co-parent you know, had children before or didn't have children, you gotta find ways to let them parent, right? We get that myth that I see is so damaging that we have to all parent the same way, we have to be on the same page. And a lot of times in blended families, the other parent doesn't feel entitled to co-parent. And that doesn't mean that they necessarily take over parenting, right? There's definitely issues there, but if you're, wanting that person you know you're blending your families you're both going to be involved in each other's children to some degree there is a line to be walked but you definitely want your children to um, know that that other person really can make some co-parenting decisions and if you don't like what they did same things apply as, as i was just talking about um so i had said that i wanted to inspire you to keep looking at wherever you go there you are the upshot is to co-parent well, is to live well, is to be a great leader, to be the leader you want your child to be. And if it's mit, you're married, it will result in you either being a great couple um, or you being able to leave, right? And, and being in a great place to walk out, which is so important. Um, strong enough to stay, my book could be called Smart Enough to Stay, right? I really feel strongly that people just aren't aware of, well, so that's part of the reason in both cases I, the title is is to bring people in, but I do know people leave because they think that it's so damaging for their child to see conflict and see disagreement. And it is damaging to see conflict not handled well, but that's where when you focus, whenever you go, there you are. If you're in a situation where there's unpleasant conflict, how are you contributing? Because defense, for example, has been said to be the first act of war. They're guaranteed there's a contribution and that you're Finding that contribution is where your power lies. Um, I did mean to say a few quick resources, and then I'm opening up to, to questions. So Michael Gazaniga, if you want to hear more about your storytelling brain, just search that on YouTube. Donna Toski, between men and women.com. She does some things online as well as a retreat, and I highly recommend that. And at some point I'll be an affiliate of hers, but she doesn't have a system set up, but and I've just found her work so profound. I highly recommend it. Um, and I did mention I, the upside, I put the upside of stress down here, and you can even YouTube her and hear some about that because those of you in really conflicted co parenting situations, I want you to know there is an upside. So I will stay on for a few minutes for questions. Um, I do have to chop even a little bit more out of the next one. There are so many things I'm wanting to get to. Um, let me stop the screen sharing. I'll come back on. Um, I can't tell if you can see me because I'm not seeing you, but it's, presumably you are. One second while I just double check. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm turning the webcam back on, I think. Um, so Cheryl, you asked, yeah, tell me if you still have questions about, yeah, when your husband yells, criticizes the rules, etc. Hard, right? Very, very hard. My hope is that you're in a situation where you're co, where you're the primary parent, so that you can do things like empathizing with your children about how hard that is, depending on the age of your children. Sometimes you can even be problem solving with them and helping them learn how to deal with the co-parent. Um, oh, good. And yeah, thank you for the 
feedback that this was a marvelous presentation, lots of useful information. Love to hear what parts I could cut, and I'll, I'll figure it out for next time because I know it's a bit too long for sure. And this, I do look forward to, to doing the course again. But yeah, so then Cheryl, then it's a matter of doing what you can to empathize with your kids. Oh, excellent. Love asking the question. Should I stand up for them in the moment we're married for now? That's a hard one because the most you'll want, you have to feel into your exact situation. Oh, and, and okay. Isn't that goofy that you can't see me? Technology, technology. Because it does say a webcam disabled while screen sharing. I see my picture. Turn webcam on. Okay, there. Good. Now you can see. Um, Sometimes I feel like I should stand up for them. So first off, you're going to have to feel into what's possible in your situation. Um, in the moment, often the most you'll want to do is say, oh, you know, if your kids are having a tough time, you can be saying something to them to the effect of, wow, you know, sorry, this is so tough. I'm really sorry you're feeling so, you're at, you know, something like that to your kids. At the same time, back them. Like if your guy's saying you lost TV for a week or something, it's brutal, right? It can be brutal in the moment, and that's where you need that long-range focus where you're clear that the win is in the long term because you want your guy to back you. You also – there's interesting ramifications even for your kids with authority in general, with teachers and things like that. So it's really helpful if you say to them something to the extent of – Sorry, sweetheart, that, that this is happening. And yeah, I know it's really um, challenging. Oh, I'm injecting. Good. Um, the other Joanna was up, so this way I'm full screen. But I'm um, sorry that most of the empathy, though, you want to do away from your co parent, right? So, like later that day, in that moment, you can say, Wow, yeah, I see you're upset. And well, your, your daddy said, no TV for a week. The fact of the matter is, no TV for a week. Yeah, it can be way more harsh than you agree with. Um, but the fact of the matter is, in the long run, your child will be okay. And again, if you keep in mind what would happen if you completely separated, then you've got no mitigating abilities, right? Um, so if it's challenging enough that even any empathy from you is going to be triggering, then then don't go there. Your kids actually will figure things out quickly, which will be that you know later you talk to them in or your partner's not home and you bring things up then and you can say, you know, I, I can see you're having a really tough time. And you could say, it's hard, isn't it? When, yeah, daddy, daddy's really strict about that stuff, isn't he? And I get that's hard. And yeah, yeah, I feel for you, right? You're not saying daddy's wrong, right? Um, and your partner will really appreciate that. It, it will take away their feeling of being not respected and the man feeling disrespected is a really huge deal for sure. It's also great if, um, yeah, if he's calling them a name, things like that, like that's where you definitely want to be working with your partner on shifting the relationship if you can, right? And and there are a number of the things that I have learned, like even in the last three, four years, I wish I had known more, a lot more. I wish I'd taken Donna's retreat, which I actually did do on my own after leaving him and not not hoping to work on that relationship. But I wish that I had taken that on my own in marriage because the more I could have shifted things to get to a place where he could be winning um, and and it's a really hard one when you get into very challenging marriage too because ultimately men have a need for admiration as for who they are and the more we kind of went down a, a bad track it's, it's hard to turn some of those things around right i get all that so you keep doing what you can in the moment while doing what you you know with your guy seeing where there's some room to shift things while continuing to work on being happier as a person so that you can leave if, if need be. And I know like that can sound like a, a brutal prescription because I'm not promising anything but will shift in your relationship. But what I am promising you 
that is profound is that you can be quickly in good space on your own if worse comes to worst, right? And I say quickly, I mean quickly can be a relative term, but what I do know to be true, which I find wild and a deep source of joy, is that I am dramatically happier. And and even on the dating scene, it's, it's pretty fun. I, I made a joke once about, you know, I think the bitter middle-aged women category is taken, but arguably I could be in that category. And I guess I'm, I'm actually going to share this in... Um, well, I'll let you read the email, but I'm going to share a couple things in the email where you'd see that, yeah, arguably um, the more well-traveled path in my situation would be to be quite bitter and, and you know, unhappy and all that. Instead, I'm actually very happy, right? So, um, oh, shoot, the video froze. Well, yeah, so, like, it's so hard because if your guy is full-on name-calling your children, so I guess that part froze, if you're – dad, the dad, the co-parent in your life is full on name calling your children. And I'm assuming you're in the marriage and he's doing it right there in, in front of you. Um, I would not say anything in that moment, but I would definitely talk to him later because unfortunately your kids are going to get used to name calling. They, they will have other times for their name called. So even though it feels urgent in that exact moment, if you're with a guy who's, who takes correction well, chances are he's not name calling, but if you're with a guy who's taking correction well, maybe you could say something in the moment. But even then, to let him really have the message out there that he's allowed to parent the way he wants to parent, that's, you know, when I talk about pushing, when you're pushing your guy to parent a certain way, then we have a natural counter will response. And I talk about this when I talk about children and, and, behavior because it drives some negative behavior but we have it too that we naturally want to push back so you will avoid counter will definitely talking to your guy afterwards and then say he's name calling but you see that he's got a concern about a value that your family has or he's concerned about how your daughter's treating you which is another value right look for why he was even going to a disciplined place in the first place you know, and discipline means to correct, to teach, right? Why was he trying to correct her behavior or his behavior? And then see if you can get some agreement about, okay, you want, hey, love that you're one of those dads. You don't just stand by. You jump in and you take some action. Love that. And and I get that, that you know, just literally praise everything you can because there is some good intention there, no doubt. Then if there's some receptivity, you can open up the conversation about, and here's, you know, I'm wondering if you've thought about doing it this way, or, you know, I'm wondering if you're aware of the ramifications of name calling. But even though, and I, and I kind of rushed through this point because because I'm still saying too much and sharing too much in the, this webinar, but even though you're co, um, like I talked about briefly, if you get it so your kids are listening to you, very few guys are going to sit back and want to name call and criticize their kids when you're able to get them to listen without them. So, yeah, does that seem stressful that you have to take the onus on you? It does. I get that. But in many situations, that is what's possible. And if you're able to do that while still in the marriage and still getting some support, and that support might be that you can go out at 9 o'clock at night for an hour when the kids are asleep, right? It might be just little things like that. But there's often a lot of benefits to working on this stuff when you're still with him. And taking the, the ownership of the fact that we as women are often the relationship leaders. And therefore, um, having our... You know, like, trying to move out of that resentment place and say, look, basically, if this is... My guy's not going to come on board with me. Um, but but what the reason why I even said it in that moment is, you guys, that much more likely to come on board with you quickly if you're nailing it yourself, right? So I really encourage you to start seeing that, that there's a real gift in shifting your perspective, taking ownership of the fact that you are the relationship expert. Chances are you're listening. That's why you're listening, right? And go from there. Um I'm aware I definitely better sign off and love the the questions and the comments. Um, please, I'd really like you to leave the webinar with a comment about one thing that you're going to do differently. 
And in order to facilitate that, I will turn my webcam off and turn the speaker off and go have lunch with my soon to be 18 and 20 year olds who they're, they're both in the um, kitchen right now. I heard them come in as we're talking. So I um, will leave though this open for just a few minutes in order to let you share some comments too, especially because there's a delay. Love to. If you've got other questions too, by all means post them and they may work their way into the next presentation or um, other aspects of my, my work that you'll benefit from in the future. Okay, so goodbye for now. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to seeing one thing that you're going to do differently.